and uh, so today uh, we will start uh, seeing how the HTTP protocol and general web technologies may help us in uh, um, exchanging or integrating different subsystems so that uh, different uh, servers in some way can exchange information among each other okay and we do that with uh, by exploiting HTTP because it's there basically so people uh, for years uh, have de developed uh, or uh, designed different protocols specifically for letting different systems uh, to exchange information and uh, at a given point in time the HTTP was so popular and there were so many tools like web servers for example very optimized very available uh, free and so on that people started to think uh, I don't need uh, any new protocol for exchanging information between two machines I can use HTTP I just put a web server on one of them a web client on the other hand uh, and uh, let's uh, uh, exchange information by making HTTP requests hmm? and uh, uh, starting from this idea of course uh, there came a, a sort of a, a design uh, architecture a, def a, defined, uh, a well defined architectures with some design criteria that helps us to use HTTP you know, for integrating applications and uh, the idea is uh, to use this uh, so called REST REST is a short term for representational state transfer which uh, is a strange word but we'll try to understand what it means actually REST was uh, first presented in the PhD thesis in the work of the PhD of this guy Roy Fielding which uh, was one of the pioneers of the internet you see that he was uh, um, in Adobe it was uh, co-founder of the Apache HTTP server and then director of the Apache Software Foundation that hosts uh, uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, open source projects so it's a man uh, who understands uh, uh, how open source works uh, and how the web servers work of course he was one of the authors of apache and in his PhD, he started to study the, the issues of how to uh, share information not just web pages basically data information using http hmm? and so he defined an architecture so he called the rest uh, a style of stof uh, software architecture it's not a library uh, but it's a way of designing things that should be platform platform independent uh, because we are on http language independent uh, because we can call um, um, an http page uh, from any language uh, and so on hmm? and uh, uh, the idea is to model the information that you want to share or the information that you want other uh, machines to manipulate on your server model them as resources so if you are you know if you have an inventory of people to manage then every person is a resource hmm? and uh, uh, if these people have uh, some documents owned by them documents are resources again and there will be some relationship uh, between the uh, re, uh, different resources so one person could be friend of another so it's a relationship between a resource of type person and another resource of type person or maybe a person can be an author of a document so it's a relationship between two resources of different types hmm? and usually resources are coming collections so the list of people the list of the collection of documents and so on so actually what uh, uh, REST tells us is to think in terms of resources and uh, collections of resources as well as the, re the relationships between different types of resources and uh, uh, we want to map these resources to URIs to, to web addresses so, so that we have one unique address that represents this person one unique address that represents that person and so on and uh, one address that, that represents the list of all persons one the list of documents a specific document and so on so we have a mapping scheme between abstract conceptual resources or collections or relationships and a concrete representation in URIs huh? 
uh, and with on these concrete representations we can uh, apply operations adding deleting modifying reading querying using the http methods so if a, a resource is a uri i can read the information about that resource by making a get request on that specific uri if a collection of persons is a uri then i can add a new person to the collection by doing a post on the uri that represents the collection and so on so we have a mapping of resources concepts to uris and the mapping of actions that you want to do on those resources at the conceptual level and http verbs uh, that are already defined they're already there so we are new we are using 98 percent of the time only get requests and two percent only post requests for sending data but there are as you saw in the in the reading the, uh, seven or eight different verbs that are already defined and they are supported by all http servers so we could use these verbs by giving them an extra meaning a more specific meaning when this verb is applied on a uri that actually is a rest resource then it means that they want to do something on that resource or on that collection on top of that uh, resources can be represented in some way so one thing is to say this uri represents uh, this person okay how do i get the information about this person the first name last name uh, birth date and so on I need to have a representation of the details of the resource this representation can be done in different ways as a text file as a binary file an xml file we use mainly json files uh, that are easy to read easy to write uh, easy to parse uh, much easier than xml and uh, and uh, of course they are natively integrated also into python so we have a concrete representation of the content of a resource that may be done in different formats so for doing some examples you can you, we could think about students and courses okay in a university system so imagine we have the designed the apis uh, for Politecnico so these apis uh, uh, will manage list of students so this URI represents the collection of all students just the name slash students and uh, slash courses represents the collection of all the courses in Polytechnico. and how to identify a given student well a given student may be identified by appending to the collection uri the an identifier a specific identifier in this case the matricular number uh, so we know that this is an identifier of an object of type student so if I stop the address here I'm referring to the whole list of students if I add one specific information item that will be the ID the identifier the name the specific name of that student and we do the same with the courses a given course is specified by giving the collection URI of all the courses and then the identifier of that specific course so there is no ambiguity between the different identifiers even every identifier only needs to work and to be unique inside their own collection so we can model collections of items of elements or individual items individual elements hmm? single elements and with this scheme we can also sorry where is that uh, model then I'll, I'll go back we can also model the relationship between elements so i can say that api polito it is less students less s one two three four five is a student slash courses is again a collection of the courses taken by this student so it's not the full list of courses but it's the collection of courses restricted to this user or the other way around uh, we may have a course up to here slash students this will be the list of uh, students enrolled in that course this is all on the conceptual level right 
then of course we need to map uh, queries on our database to make this happen there's nothing automatic here we are just trying to create a mapping between the concepts of how of what information we have and how it's related how it's connected and we try to map them into specific uh, uris so there are some guidelines of course uh, like uh, for names of resources you all try always to use nouns uh, in the plural form like courses and try to be as specific as possible because a collection called items or called list uh, doesn't mean anything doesn't give you any information we want URIs that can be read and understood uh, at first sight or nearly at first sight and then on these uh, names these URIs we can operate operate with the HTTP verbs get is a verb for retrieving something so if I get if I send a get request so an HTTP, a normal a very normal HTTP request of type get to a URI that represents an item an element then in the HTTP response body I expect to have all the properties of the element the full description of that specific element if I try to get on a collection URI then the response will be the collection so the list of the items then this list may be full filled uh, filled with all the information about each of the items or maybe shortened just with the IDs probably or so with some uh, basic information this is a detail that is not specified here but I do a get on a collection I will get the list uh, of elements if I get an, the name of an element I will get the detail of that element the same if I want to create a new element inside a list inside a collection elements cannot be there out in, in the air they always must be <laughs> uh, inside some collection that specify their type and in this case I can, I can use post post creates a new element that I'm posting to a collection so in this case the HTTP request will have the description of the resource in the request body like when we submit a form in the form when we submit a form in the HTTP request body we have the encoding of all the data containing the form and the same can be done here we post to a collection and the collection will be increased by a new element we can also have a put that usually changes uh, some element property so I put a, a new element and it will replace some data inside an existing element usually we may we delete uh, to delete one element from a collection or to delete all the elements from a collection if you use that on the collection so we can give an interpretation of the effects that these primitives get post put that are defined for HTML pages the effect that these primitives may have over collections or over items hmm. uh, for example uh, imagine we are dealing with docs so we have a docs URI that is the collection of the, all the docs and docs one two three four this is who is a specific doc okay get uh, give me the list uh, of all the docs get slash docs will give me the list of the docs get docs one two three four will give me a, a small probably is a json document with all the information about that specific doc post uh, on the collection creates a new dog uh, when and if the post request contains a json description of all the information about that doc and usually we don't the doing a post onto an element doesn't have any meaning uh, put uh, usually works for elements and just updates information all the information about this specific dog can be updated or deleting uh, all this information or deleting the elements from the collection altogether uh, usually you don't do delete or put onto re uh, collections hmm? It's, uh, or dangerous it's either dangerous or um, updating all the elements with the same kind of information it's usually well seldom useless 
seldom useful. Um, well, I have something to say. Um, yeah, this same principle also applies to more complex URIs. So, for example, if I have uh, courses, this course name slash students, if I want to add the new student to this course, I will make a post here. And then we'll add a student to this specific list of the students enrolled in this course. While if I make a post in general to students, it will enroll the students at the university level. Okay? So there are, at each level, the meaning uh, uh, of the post or the gets, uh, of course, is interpreted con depending on the, on the whole, the, all the hierarchy of uh, identifiers that I find on my way. And uh, um, in general, when I design an API, I need to specify the URIs, the scheme of the URIs, the meaning of the verbs. This, this was uh, a possible example, but we need to be more specific about what you can do, what get you can do on which address and so on. And then specify the representation of the objects. You can choose different formats. Uh, usually people uh, choose between XML or, and JSON. Usually, or in some cases, also fragments of, of HTML, which is very ugly to see. Uh, but it depends uh, on what you want. Usually, if you have some, uh, you know, complex library or website which is very big, uh, you may also give uh, the option of encoding the same information in different ways. So, if a client wants uh, some information in XML, you, you return. In the response and HTML content if the client wants a JSON you will reply with a JSON file so there should be a mechanism for example to specify I want that resource in that specific format and this uh, usually is done with an accept he header in the HTTP request so they say I want uh, this request uh, in this format application JSON some other libraries use other conventions so they attach a fake extension to the name so this dot json is not actually part of the name but it's a hint for saying i want it in json format or with a fake query saying let's specify the format so if you use different libraries they have different ways of doing the same thing the concept is the same i want to specify the format okay the mechanism may 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 change and this idea is uh, you know the the standard way of creating apis today uh, i just listed some of these uh, documentations uh, of this of major websites uh, just to show you that uh, most uh, big websites uh, do have an api in rest format uh, with all the documented uh, um, let's say methods and uh, and um, and resources and so on hmm? so we don't have time to browse all of them but let's just, uh, just pick the first one and you see that uh, you have all the specification about the methods uh, and uh, okay so where is that uh, the representation of information and finally what is that sorry it's not here um, okay if you want to do something for example with a project uh, it will tell you how to get the list uh, of the projects of a given user so it tells you that you can get the list of the projects by get uh, repos so repo is a collection of all the repositories owner the idea of an owner the idea of a repository slash projects 
so the repository of an owner and they want to see the projects inside the, uh, that repository for example if i want to see all the repository of a person what is that repositories list your own repositories and just get users repos when you are authenticated with your name if you want to list the user the public repository of another user users the username slash repos and so on so it maps all the conceptual information requests into uris that are always built with the same kind of syntax hmm? all the organization of a, of a re, of an organization so you get the repos of an organization and not of an user so you get the same type of collection nested inside a different type of resource hmm? and this is github uh, twitter is the same it is a concept of a message and the message is uh, all the information about the sender uh, the linked image uh, the date uh, uh, whether it's a reply and so on hmm? google calendar maybe can be useful hmm? so twitter uh, i enlisted these ones because they are actually useful to integrate with so all the here the main concept would be calendar and event so we have uh, different many events inside the calendar the events can make, may have a time it may have attendees and so on the same can be done with facebook hmm? uh, all the information is accessible with the rest api through what they call the fa the, the graph, graph apis so that links all the information about the users and then you can sell them and um, okay so this is the basic um let me skip uh, oh one very painful part of apis is always authentication uh, you already saw that with uh, telegram that you need to go there and get an api key and then paste the api key in your application and register the application and make okay that was simple okay uh in, uh, in many websites uh, today use a, me an a mechanism called all out version two that's uh, actually a two or three step process uh, you need to have a, a register as a developer and then register your application get a key for the application and then do the login the first time uh, in the in, in interactive way and then store the token so it's a very complex mechanism uh, fortunately there are libraries that help us uh, doing that but uh, uh, our experience is that in the past uh, a lot of people found found it for example difficult to integrate with the uh, google calendar not because of the api but because of the authentication of putting the right token in the right place uh, and getting all the authorization right hmm? so that is uh, one critical point uh, that you need to and every provider has a different way of doing that hmm? so this is uh, a very painful part uh, and because we want to go past we want to test our code and first we need to get the code and understand the, how to use it hmm? okay um so the the idea is that if we have one kind of our service we want to design some apis so imagine your to-do list hmm? right now we have a database you learned how to create an, a console application you learned how to build a, a telegram bot for querying for doing the same of operations on the to-do list you learned how to create a web application for doing the same operations and how if we want just to see the to-do list as a service something that, uh, that runs on a computer that manages the to-do list and we want to expose the information on the to on the to-do list uh, through a set of services uh, an api that everybody can call with the proper authorization of course and can get the information can query can add and so on at that point we can create uh, maybe another website that will integrate our information our to-do list in their website we can create a mobile application on, on the smartphone that can show the information by querying the api all mobile applications work in this way not all most of them the information is stored in some server somewhere 
and the application that runs on your smartphone queries the server through an API. The same API is used by the mobile application, the same API is used by the apps that you can develop, uh, like the Facebook apps, for example, that are normal websites that just query the Facebook, the Facebook graph uh, for doing something, and so on. So today, there's a very common way of separating the logics of your system by defining a public API and then creating many different types uh, of, uh, of applications that use this API. Hmm? Uh, for example, what the Telegram did was in this way. They first defined the API, they built the server, and then they said, create our clients, create, create, create the clients. And different people created Windows clients and mobile clients and so on. There was a contest and they chose the best one to become the official one. But actually, they, they all can do the same thing because the, the API is published. If you want the same, you can go for Slack, for example. If you want to integrate your own application, you have an API, you just have to program and to send the same comments. Hmm? So the idea is how, how do you design the names, the collections, the resources from your application? Oh, uh, what you see is that um, a lot of, uh, or not a lot, several companies started to reason about this problem and publish some guidelines. Huh? So there are guidelines from uh, Atlassian for, uh, there was one for Adidas, uh, you see here. Uh, this, this website tries to collect that. So many major companies, the Amazon one, published some guidelines saying, okay, if you want to develop APIs in our infrastructure or inside our company, we have some guidelines for you to use. So they are all similar, but with uh, some you know, specific choices on, in the details. And for example, what is interesting is the Google API that I'm using here for giving some examples. And Google says, it's a document, that this was an internal document to Google developers saying, when you develop the APIs for, let's say, Gmail or Google Calendar, follow these rules. And then they made this document public uh, so that we, are, we also can follow or be inspired by the same rules as Google employees do. And they say, for designing an, an API, first you need to determine what type of resources you provide and the relationship between the resources. So these two steps are just conceptual steps on the blackboard, on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. There's no code yet. Then we can map resources onto name schemes so the arrays. so how do we write this, this URI? in which order do we list the elements uh, with the, all the slashes and the resource schemas a given resource okay it will be represented in json good which fields do we know do we have into in this json and so on and uh, decide which methods are applicable to every type of resource Maybe it doesn't make sense to put on a given collection uh, or, and uh, it makes sense on another. So you, you need to decide which methods apply to which elements. Mm -hmm. And what you will find out uh, is that a well-designed API usually has a very, very few set of methods and many different uh, resource types. So very rich in terms of resources and the relationship between resources and the basic operations are more or less the same. Google calls them uh, list, get, create, update, and delete. So basically they say the standard method, what they call standard methods are five. And these five standard methods will be mapped uh, to HTTP methods, of course, huh? in the way that we already expect. But first they say, decide which standard methods apply to your resource hmm? do we want to create on this collection yes if yes then decide uh, at the http level what information should be provided hmm? but they always uh, suggest you think about these five standard methods if they are not enough you can define custom methods but they say it's very unlikely that you need that hmm? if you need to create many custom methods it means that your Conceptual resources are not good, hmm? were uh, not designed well. Uh, this is an example of the design of Gmail. So Gmail has all the APIs under this address, 
gmail google ipis .com slash and there's a collection of users and every user with a username has a, a set of sub collections uh, messages threads labels history profile settings and so on so this is all the hierarchy inside the users uh, collection so all this information are information about a specific user a user may have different messages may have different threads threads are a collection of messages in a way so inside threads there will be also the the the, the messages again but only those messages that belong to this thread and so on so for example for searching a message you can search by label you can search by thread mm -hmm. there is no ser search method here mm -hmm. you're just providing information by entering the different uh, um, um, sub collections and then there are some resources that are a bit strange because these are, are actually messages threads labels are actually description of the messages of the mail huh? and profile and settings are something about the user so the, you have the two different families now something about the, uh, the user profile the settings the preferences which is static information doesn't change very often in fact a user has only one profile singular there is no slash that is not this is not a collection it's just one resource settings it's only one resource with all the list of settings while messages is a collection that holds many different messages each with their own representation hmm? so this is the, the part that is not uh, easy to come up with if you have a complex application this may or may not represent your database tables so an easy way would be to match as resources your tables in the database it makes sense in many cases if your database is simple but there's no requirement to do that maybe this is much much simpler than the actual implementation of your tables where you have to keep keep track of uh, a million different uh, particular cases so the user register is not register is activated does it have uh, any friends or not so maybe represent it differently well at the api level it will bo it, it must be all much much simpler hmm? try to simplify it and think in general terms from outside what is the conceptual model that I want my users, so the programmers that want to use my services and to want to pay for my services, what is the, the mental model I want my developers to see about my service? Hmm? And Google says that the resource names, uh, okay, are just a con concatenation of different IDs. Some of them would be collection IDs some would be individual resources IDs. Hmm? So in this case, uh, inside the collection of users, there is one specific user th that is identified uh, by their um, email address. So it may be just an, an identifier here, uh, users, or maybe even more complex they did. No, nobody says it should only be made by numbers or by letters. What we want to keep is the slash as the separator. So let's try not to use slashes or spaces inside the, ident the identifiers, but then the, the set of characters depends on us. And then this resource as a sub-resource, which is a, a sub-sub-resource that is ca uh, called custom from, which is the from address that you, can, that you may modify in your settings. So you have all this uh, sequence um, The suggestion is that uh, names for resources should be correct English words, uh, nouns uh, in plural. You may abbreviate, but it's not very suggested. And use uh, simple terms uh, and use the, these terms uh, uh, consistently. So always call in the same way, the same concept, uh, and different names for different concepts. Uh, they may be trivial suggestions, uh, they are written in the guidelines. Uh, and um, and try to avoid also names that conflict with keywords in programming languages hmm? uh, because uh, pro probably your programmers would, would want to call 
uh, users the variable that will hold the list of users okay so users is a good uh, identifier for a variable if you call them uh, i don't know array uh, then probably the programming language has a reserve uh, word for array and uh, and uh, you need then the user will need to invent a new different word so if you if you avoid this hmm, it will be better for the programmers and also the collection names or resource names a collection name collection should be more more restricted they say that they should be valid as identifiers in a programming language so for example users is a valid identifier name at example.com is not a valid identifier okay in in using the api i will probably have a, a variable with the name of the collection i won't have the variable with the name of a specific id i will call it user or this user something like that so there are re less restrictions on resource name than on collection names but the general rules are the same and what you should you should avoid are general terms elements entries instances items objects types resources and so on they don't mean anything okay they're too general try to be specific about what this collection contains does it contain students does it contain courses does it contain tasks in the to-do list hmm? and uh, the five standard methods are list get create update and delete and how do we implement them in http with these five rules get on the collection url lists uh, gives you a list get on the resource uh, so collection or versus resource gets the information about this, the specific resource create uh, is implemented by posting to a collection updating is implemented by putting to a resource so not to a collection and delete uh, uh, it will delete uh, a single resource so these are ju just the, fain, the five standard methods that google acknowledges they should be used uh, um, everywhere you find it possible to use for this uh, the request so we have an http request and an http response the request will have a body in these two cases create and update especially create i want to create a new item so I, I need to provide all the information about this item in other cases i don't need any i don't need any body in the, in the request the response usually gives back the copy of the response of the resource in a get of course you're getting the description of the resource in the post uh, the suggestion is to give back to return the description of the resource that was just submitted but maybe you have some auto increment id that was not specified by the creator and it's only known after the element has been added so a post should return a copy of the element itself a put uh, should return a copy of the modified element hmm? so maybe the caller doesn't need them but if it does uh, if you know it's, uh, it doesn't cost anything to you once you have added the resource just to return a copy of it hmm? and uh, let's not speak about delete because i'm always allergic to deleting so if you want more information about how google thinks about these methods you can go to this page uh, and for each of them it will tell you for example for list uh, all the suggestions uh, what method to use uh, what should be in the request uh, what should be in the response and so on hmm? more details uh, but i think we already got the general message and uh, well that's it basically so uh, right now we are set out to uh, creating this uh, mapping conceptual mapping but so from resources to you arise but we still need uh, need to work on the implementation level so very nice i have a get uh, for a resource name how do you implement that in python how do i read and write and modify uh, how can i return a json response with the proper encoding in the and the http response how do i decode a json object from the post request and so on so very practical issues uh the response is uh, 
actually very easy. F so for implementing uh, REST interfaces using Flask, we have these three rules, basically. And then we'll see them in practice. First, uh, of course, we need to match the URI schema with the route in Flask. Okay, so we route the request for collection to a function, the request for an item or, uh, to another function. We need to specify in the route whether we are dealing with get or post methods. So we can use uh, different functions for responding to a get request or to a post request on the same name. And you can use parametric routes, uh, you know, uh, uh, routes with the name uh, with a parameter in angular uh, brackets, user slash ID. Uh, for uh, mapping families of URIs to a same function and, have read, have, and having a flash to extract the parameter name for you. Then, if you need to return a JSON file, for example, you have a GET request, you want to return the, the, representation, the representation of the object in JSON, it's very simple because in Flask we have a method called JSONify. So, transform to JSON that takes any kind of Python object, serialize that into JSON, which is more or less what the method uh, json.dump in the standard library does. But JSONify actually doesn't return only a JSON object, it, re it returns uh, a more complete uh, HTTP response object. And this response is already pre-configured with all the encoding values representing the content of the JSON. So if you, re you, do, you just don't return an object, you return JSONify of the object, and then Flask does all the bookkeeping uh, to encode the response in JSON and uh, encode the HTTP response with the proper head headers for the response itself. So this is in the case when you are returning an object. And when, you, when you're receiving a request, for example, a create, create which will be a post with a JSON payload. In that case, uh, request, which we already know it's a uh, we all, we already use the request object from flask uh, by for getting the form data request.form you remember there is another field request.json that will parse the data in the in the http request uh, if this data is in json it will return a python object uh, with all the information uh, corresponding to that object so it already we already do all this work for us so it will be very actually easy to write this implementation. So let's try to implement a very simple API. I already won uh, uh, on, on GitHub, but I will create a new one here just to we, so that we can do it together. REST API test. Hmm? So we create a new Flask environment. So imagine that we want to deal with the list of uh, what? Users, for example so that we can later, you can generalize it to, to tasks huh, in the next, next time. So we wait until the creation of the virtual environment. And just to be quick, uh, I don't uh, store all the users into, the, into a database, I just store them into a list in, uh, in my main program, just to, for testing, okay? Okay, so imagine that we want to represent a list of users like user one is a dictionary where we represent uh, uh, the first name which is me for example last name Sorry, it's colon, not equal. It's a, di it's a dictionary. Hmm? First name. And then user two could be Luigi. For example, okay. What is missing here? I, st I don't have right now, imagine this is another, is another database an identifier, a, a unique identifier for these elements, for these items. So 
So the first name or the last name are not unique. I must add an additional identifier so that every element can be recognized, can be gotten by name. Hmm? So I need to add the, the general rule that you get from the Google guidelines is to add another attribute called name and give name maybe one, maybe the initials or something like that. So you should have an attribute called name that represents the unique identifier. Uh, think of it as, as the ID of the element. Google suggests you use name instead of ID, <laughs> mainly because in this way you cannot use name in any other context. Because they said, we found that name w was a very confusing word, name, uh, because it may refer to many different things. The name of what? So they decide, they decide in, their, in their guidelines, name should be a, the ID of the resource. If you have added other names, like first name or last name, qualify them. Course name, <laughs> person name, okay, university name, task name. Never use name alone because it's ambiguous. Well, Google says use name as the identifier of the element. So every element for us, for, or in every collection, should always have a name attribute. So Luigi De Rossi, Louis LDR, for example, and so on. So our database could be a database called users, uh, defined as the list of user one and user two. Okay, this is just a very simple, stupid database. Hmm? In memory, could be into SQLite, could be into MySQL, doesn't matter. We want to focus on the APIs. So, our you, uh, API schema should be that our resources are users, and, our, and we have a collection. called of users hmm? so uh, the URI for the users should be users for example and the URI for each user should be user users slash uh, the name for example in this way so right now we only have these concepts the representation of a given user is just these three names encoded in JSON. So we can, on the user's collection, we can implement the li a list method with a get or a create method with a, a post. On the element itself, we can get implement a get with the get method it's called that uh, sorry i don't remember whether google calls them just to be consistent in names uh, yes get update and delete uh, will not be implemented in this version especially not delete hmm? so but if, if we if you want uh, we could also implement an update uh, with a with a put or, or a delete with a delete method in, the, in the only on the resource not on the collection so actually we have three methods get list and create on these resources with this you arise okay so the first one let's start from the collection it's easier uh, we list the collection so we define a new route of uh, users. So we define a method which is a list users. Right? So it's also easy to give the names of the method because the name of the operation and the name of the resource in which we are operating. 
so we want the list of all the users in, our, in, the, in the collection in our, the user collection uh, right now we already have it it's this python variable okay so in but in general it should be get the list uh, of objects uh, into a python variable or basically it would be a list probably in this case we already have it okay and we already have these users we just need to return it in json format so what did it say is that we can return jsonify users jsonify is a method in flask so what does this method do take this object this is a python object it's a list we just created it there there converts that into json and construct an http response object with all the headers containing this as a response payload that's it we created our first REST API does it work don't know let's try so we open the website and we try to write uh, slash uh, users no without the slash like that and what we get is actually a JSON so in this case it's Firefox that is imp interpreting the JSON in this but basically this is the actual payload and you see that the headers returned uh, already set the application slash json content type uh, on the response so jsonified already did everything for you we set the, the application json content type and we serialized our objects in json with this json syntax which is very similar basically to the python syntax for creating lists and dictionaries and it will be also similar to the javascript syntax that we learned um, on thursday so in this case we return the full list of all the elements maybe it's a bit too much maybe we want only to return the names not all the details because if you have a very large list of very big objects uh, returning everything maybe too much we don't you don't need everything together so maybe you decide that the list only represents the name you should re always return the names uh, plus maybe other information maybe not all of that but maybe not all the information if you only want to return the names then you just have to construct the right object here so it would be some user names uh, would be a list uh, of name um, no it's a user dot name for user in users okay do you read the syntax it's a list comprehension it's a list square brackets constructed in a for so I'm saying iterate the variable user for in the list users for each iteration return username so the, the field name for that user it's a, like a for loop uh, condensed in a row and so it can return usernames uh, and in this case probably it might work and return only the names hmm? in this case it's just a list it's no longer a list of objects it's just a list of strings hmm? 
if I want to make it a list of objects, uh, I should create a list of dictionaries, not just a list of strings. Uh, So I create in the list, uh, every element of the list would be a dictionary with a key is always name and the value is the name, the, the ID of before. So right now you see it like this. So it's the same as before, but without the other information. It depends, this is what we call the representation schema for the resource. How is this JSON formatted? What, uh, what are the fields? What is, what's the information we, that is in the JSON? We can decide. And we see very easy to construct. Uh, mm. the, in this case, we already have everything in Python, so it's just uh, playing with the variables here, with the lists. Uh, if it were information in a database, we just modify the query for getting the information that we need. Okay? Users. And if you want information about a single user, okay, up the throughout, a single user, as sorry. I, as a, an address like users slash username. So this syntax in Flask says, I want to match all the URIs with this syntax, where name is a parameter. And so we have defined the method get users name. This variable name matches this name here. Okay. The name under brackets is the part of the, of the URI that is matched, and the matching string becomes the parameter of the get users function. And now we do the same. We find the user with this name, and then return that. So the user should be the user for user in users uh, if uh, user dot user name equal to name so for user in users i iterate over the users collection i only select the elements that match this if condition so only if the name of this user that I'm iterating is equal to the name given as parameter to the function. If it is, it will be included in the collection, in the list. I don't know how many items will be in this list, from zero to many. Probably not many, not more than one, if the name is actually unique. Um, and so I need to check on the length of this list. If this list only contains one element, then it's the one I want. If it doesn't contain one element, maybe zero, then something is wrong. So if the length of the user is uh, one, then I'm good, I can return this one element. Return JSONify of user one, user zero, sorry. Because the list only contains one element, uh, but it's still a list, so I need to pick the first and one element. Otherwise, something's wrong, so I could return an error message or something like that. Let's return for, for the, just for beginning, uh, and a null, a null object in Python. Then we'll see how to return errors with the error messages and so on. Hmm? So in this case, We go, we redeploy the application. And if we go into the browser, okay, users still works. And is user slash FC. 
will give so we get users slash fc the information about the user whose uh, name is fc and if uh, ldr becomes which the rules and it's something else uh, it's error right hmm? right now we are not managed we are not correctly handling this error hmm? uh, for ending the error i one way is to use like this no sorry the get method the we could jsonify a fake json that contains the error message so instead of just throwing an exception we return a still valid json and the content of the json would be the mess the error message not just uh, the document where we don't have but uh, we can set the status code of the response to 404 not found instead of the normal 200 response code that will go out uh, when you are jsonifying a, a valid object hmm? so we we exploit the fact that jsonified re returns a full response to modify the attributes of the response before returning return it to the browser to the client hmm? so this is a better way of handling the errors return an actual error message user not found name and then we set the response code to an HTTP error message not found and finally we can return the response this response hmm? so we don't hide the errors we don't crash on the errors but we return the errors to the client that then can do something about it so in this case if we try to ask for a non-existing users user we will get a message instead of the user information a message and uh, well in this case doesn't tell me the, the the return code but we know it's uh, 404 hmm? so it's an error response with some payload inside that can be filtered by the client okay right now we are playing with the browser because with the browser is easy to make a get request you just have to write the address hmm, in the address bar but if you want to test it so we are creating an api how do, do we call this api from another application even before because our next step would be to issue a post and we don't know how to do that with the browser okay so right now we are testing that in an interactive way but can we write a, a very simple test program a client that will call this api for us because the api actually is not intended for users it's intended for programs hmm? so how do we write a, the client of an of a rest api so we can create a new python file can be in this project can be in another project can be in another computer that will make calls to my API so for example uh, call client let's call it client so a client will make HTTP requests to our API in the main for example just a very test program hmm? and uh, what is the best the easiest way in Python to make HTTP requests it's using uh, the request package in Python, in the Python library you already have an HTTP lib uh, library pack module but the request is uh, maybe 100 times simpler and faster to use so everybody uses requests hmm? and uh, actually to make a, a get request you just have to pass this request.get the URL 
and then this R is the content of the response that comes back. So just one line. Hmm? That will make, that it will turn your program into an HTTP client that will make the request, wait for the answer, parse it, and so on. So in our client, uh, we use requests. Uh, and uh, don't tell me it's not there and uh, uh, I want to install it okay install package requests installing and while we write the test program We want to check, for example, the list of users. So we have the users uh, is request uh, dot get uh, slash or oh, let's set maybe a base URL base URL to the common part to avoid typing too much. Uh, So users would be the base URL plus uh, users. And we can see what comes out. Hmm? So it's a very simple program that does this request. So we are, this is a client of our API. If I run it, I expect to see in my console down here the list uh, of the usernames, the, the identifiers. Okay, so let's try to run it. Run client. Ah, sorry, response users dot. This uh, is a response object. Okay, I should extract the JSON. You should tell that this is a, re a JSON response and they want to see the object corresponding to it. Hmm. Like this. Hmm. An array of dictionaries with the names. Uh, I could do this like that, Jason. Let's put it here. So that users is a real list. Okay? I just forgot the JSON there. I moved it up. And then we can maybe iterate over the user list and get the information for every user. For user in users you can just uh, get uh, so user info is the request of get uh, base url plus uh, users slash uh, the name of the user user name Remember the name was the key for this value. So we are making many requests. Requests, sorry. Many requests. One in this loop, one for every username that we got from the list of the users. Dot JSON. And we can print this user information. So we get the list, information about the first user, information about the second user. You see, it takes uh, fractions of a second. This is not instantaneous because we are making an HTTP call to another web server that gets the call because the JSON does the work and return. So there's a run-through time to pay for that. But the simplicity 
compared to other methods of getting that information is really one line of code here and one line for the implementation remember so this is the client side of an api the server side of the api is the just the flex flex methods huh? so very easy to implement and you see that actually the the website was still running and it got all these queries hmm? from our client test cli client okay the last um, operation that we want to do is a uh, uh, creation of a new element so this is the first time in which we have to actually send some data to the server but the pattern is always the same we route the URI of the resource, of the collection, sorry, users, because we post on the collection. We say that this is a post request, not a get. So we need to specify the methods of this, uh, that apply to this route, uh, that is uh, post. And then we define on this route the create users method. right uh, let's not do any controls okay we need to, a lot, to do a lot of checking here but in the sake of time we try to just let it work uh, without any error checking create users is a post request that in the body of the request uh, there should be the JSON representation of a new user to create how do we extract this information new user is request dot json requested again sorry something that we need to import from flask so the flask is already parsing the body of the request if it is json it, it will already give us a new object and this object now we should check that the new user is uh, actually representing a user not a cow or for example or a beer or something else it should it should have the the fields uh, first name and last name expected for a user object uh, hmm? because right now anything is a, j a valid, valid json but if it is and the new user dot name should not be already be in the collection because we don't want uh, to allow inserting a duplicate user id these are the checks that should be there huh? let's implement them later not, not now hmm? and once i'm sure that this new user is a sane and valid value i just add it to my database in this case, it just users dot append new user, and then, as Google says, it should return a copy of it because it didn't do anything special. So there are too many P's here. So the only difference is that we are getting some information from the body of the post request in JSON format. And we are modifying, in this case, our database. On the client side, on the client side, so after we dump our database, we can try to add a new user. So the new user is uh, we we'll, we'll represent it with uh, a name uh, first name and the last name uh, 
let's choose Einstein so we, have, we are in a good company and we want to call the API for adding the new user so in this case it's a request dot push post URL and you see that one of the many optional arguments is just is already JSON you can specify the post data textual in, in, in text format or in JSON format so you just have to write the URL that is uh, base URL plus users and the body should have a JSON from the object new user that should be it and to check it we just try to repeat this code here and to print the list of users again after we added Albert Einstein so we ju I just copy and pasted the get of the users and then the details of the users So let's run it again. Uh, did I restart the application? No. And then let's run it. So it will print the first list, add, reprint the list. It doesn't work because uh, it, it has not been added. So it's not working because I have some. request.json is not callable that's sorry I, I forgot one detail because, ah, okay because json sorry it's an it's an attribute it's not a method like this so let's try it again okay you see that there's a new name here because the post actually works this time hmm? and now the list of names are, are three of course we need a real backend in the, to the database for this but the api hmm, is already taking shape so imagine you have your system your project with different uh, you have some data into one raspberry in a corner how to get data to and from that computer you just implement a web server with a REST API and it's very easy to communicate with that. Okay? Of course, you need to think beforehand about which kind of data. That would be the dif difficult part and difficult to, to modify. But hmm? Any questions? Okay, so thank you for tonight.